Well, I'm Susan Barron, and I am one of the luckiest women in the world. Well, when a doctor walks in with that look on her face, you know this is not good news. And she said to me, your blood work is way out of whack. You need to go home, pack a bag, and call 911, and get to the hospital as quickly as possible. I met Susan back in May of 2023. She was recently discharged from the ED due to severe hyperglycemia. For those cases, we just want to make sure there isn't any more nefarious situations going on besides just the sugars being elevated. So I did end up referring her to the pancreatic screening study because I did notice a very in large increase in her A1C in a short amount of time. She went from an A1C of 6.1%, which is very well controlled type 2 diabetes, to up to 13.8%. And, um, and that rose some red flags because there wasn't a really good explanation why that happened. She didn't change her medications or anything like that. Her diet hasn't changed. Um, she's also in the age group where, you know, we worry about other causes for diabetes um, and the fact that she was losing about 20 pounds in the last uh, few months were all different red flag signs. And so he looked up and he said, you know, you might want to check out this amazing study at Norwalk Hospital. Dr. Richard Frank is conducting state-of-the-art work. Then I went home and investigated who in the world is this Dr. Richard Frank. Uh, the goal is to ultimately uh, demonstrate that for individuals with diabetes, either new onset diabetes or those who have had chronic diabetes that suddenly deteriorates, uh, we can identify those at a higher risk of pancreatic cancer. So the MRI is once at the beginning of the study. We review all the imaging with a committee, which consists of radiologists, um, hepatobiliary surgeons, and Dr. Frank. And uh, if there is something abnormal on that first MRI, there may be a second MRI as part of the study. It's, it's like a follow-up MRI. Uh, Susan's MRI showed a tumor in the pancreas that was localized to the pancreas, had not spread anywhere else. So it was what we call resectable. Pancreatic cancer overall for all patients who are diagnosed has a five-year survival of 13%. But that's because 85% are diagnosed unresectable. 15% are diagnosed when the cancer can be resected, like Susan's and the five-year survival for all those who are resected is 50%. Okay, 50, 13. Clearly, if we could catch the cancer early, we could save a lot of lives. So it was quite fortunate that we were able to operate uh, on Ms. Barron at a stage one level. It is quite rare to get at an early stage. Part of the reason is that there is no great screening study, but also, there are no signs and symptoms that show up in the early stages. She had a very routine course. The small size of the tumor allowed us to use a minimally invasive technique that could be both robotic or laparoscopic, but what it does involve is use small incisions um, and sort of arms that go into the abdomen that then allow you to do a lot of the work without a big incision. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the goal of the of leaving in the operating room is to remove the cancer completely and 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 appropriately. If we can do that with minimally invasive techniques, why not? The second day, when I was recover when I was in my room recovering, um, Dr. Labo came right into my room with a big smile on his face, and he said to me, "Your surgery was very boring." And at that point, they had di diagnosed me at stage one. Stage one pancreatic cancer. We want to keep her out of the hospital doing what she wants to do in her life, not seeing doctors all the time. So the fact that she's recovered so quickly means we don't need to see her that often, which is, which is what it's all about. She did actually write me a nice note, and I always joke, I'd, I'm happy to correspond. After five years, you don't need to see me anymore and just send me a postcard that you're doing great. And you know, this is why we do this, to get people back to their normal, normal lives so they can enjoy their families, their friends, do what they like to do and not worry about being in the hospital. I am working. I am 
seizing life, I find myself so thankful and so tearful at this point um, because I'm so grateful. I am so appreciative. I'm crying at the daffodils and the hyacinths. I, I see people from both groups of the study. People that have watched their loved ones die of pancreatic cancer. They, they've seen their loved ones die. So they are grateful. So what motivates me is uh, the potential to save more lives and finding more, more people like Susan. The survival rate is too dismal and I'm hoping that we can change that. The chemo is not a walk in the park. The first three rounds, are rel you feel relatively fine and a little tired maybe, but that really was it. And I remember going to Thanksgiving dinner and saying, this is not so bad. If this is what chemo is like, I'm fine. I didn't realize that it's cumulative. And so it builds up in your body and then you began to have increasing um, symptoms. Um, mine were not really horrible. It was more fatigue and I had to learn more and more to listen to my body and not push. And they have a wonderful ceremony in the cancer center where um, you ring a bell and I just remember going out into the sunshine and looking up and it was kind of a beautiful robin's egg blue day. And Dr. Frank said to me, well, now it's time to go live your life. What do you say to people who have saved your life? <laughs> I, I can't say any more than I am cherishing every minute of my life because of you two. Uh. What is it like when you drive to Norwalk <laughs> Hospital in the Wadian Cancer Center? Well, it's the strangest feeling because as I drive up that hill, I feel as if I am coming home. I'm coming home to the place that saved my life and I'm coming home to Dr. Frank and his staff and all the nurses and doctors who gave me back the most precious thing in my life, which is my life.